next speaker then is Lisa Randall from one Harvard, two. and she will talk about unification in world one, extra dimensions one, two, in bulk holography. I don't want to put it too high, I want to put it about that level. It's very difficult, it's very small. Uh, uh, Luke, I don't know if you've got a belt. No, I don't know. It's difficult, isn't it? Okay. Should we right? Okay. Is it on? Okay, can you hear me? Okay, so in the last talk, um, we heard some complicated aspect of four dimensions. But I'm going to talk about today about one thing that's good about four dimensions, which is that you get this beautiful logarithmic running of the couplings so that couplings can actually unify in a four-dimensional theory. And in particular, in supersymmetric theories broken at the weak scale, it's known that couplings unify very nicely. Um, however, this has been used as an argument why... Um, extra dimensions are unlikely as solutions to the hierarchy problem. Because um, not only do you not see this precise unification of couplings, it's argued that you can't possibly have unified couplings. So the first part of my talk is going to talk about why that's not true in um, highly curved space, and in particular in the warp scenario um, that addresses the hierarchy. And in the second part, of, and we're going to do the calculation of cup unification of couplings purely in the five-dimensional theory, but we're nonetheless going to see logarithmic behavior of the running of the coupling. In other words, we're going to see four-dimensional behavior when we do the calculation in the five-dimensional theory. And the second part of the talk, which hopefully I'll have time a few minutes for, I'll tell you how one might generalize this idea to see how to count states more generally in curved spaces. So this more or less says what I just said. One of the biggest arguments given, there are really two big arguments given about extra dimensions. One is that if you have a low scale, then global symmetries are going to be violated. And that has been addressed in various ways. The other is unification of couplings, which um, seem like a more, in particular, unification of couplings at a high energy scale, which seemed somehow um, more robust in defying extra dimensions. So the question I want to ask today is, do we have to abandon high scale unification and logarithmic running of the couplings when we have extra dimensions? And I want to argue that it's quite natural in uh, the warped hierarchy scenario that in ADS that solves the hierarchy problem so long as the gauge bosons are in the bulk of the space, not on the brain. So to motivate this, I first want to just tell you what the obvious reasons why it's considered um, hard to have unification with extra dimensions. Um, and I think a lot of them are actually based on large extra dimensions. Um, with large extra dimensions, the idea was to have the fundamental scale be a TV, that is to say, the quantum gravity scale um, TV. So the, really, the highest energies you're going to really consider are on the order of the TV scale. Um, so clearly, you're not going to get unification at a high scale. Um, another problem is that you have a large dimension, which means if you were to use this idea of putting gauge bosons in the bulk, you would be required to have very unnatural values for the couplings. And the last reason um, is that even if you have not so large extra dimensions, um, you have power law running. You, you need to get a lot of running if you're going to unify between MZ and a TEV. We know their couplings are not unified at the Z mass, and we'd like them to unify at a scale of order TV. So they have to run quickly, and maybe that happens through power law running, but we really don't trust the calculation there. I, I just want to spend a moment to say why you're getting this power law running, because it will make it more clear why in the curved space you don't have this power law running. So if you imagine... Um, just doing a renormalization of the gauge boson in some extra dimensional space with n extra dimensions, it's clear just on dimensional grounds that it's going to go like cut off to the nth, nth power. Um, um, an easier way to extrapolate from this is to think of it in terms of Kaluza Klein modes. So if you were tra to try to do a four dimensional effective theory, um, you could just do it in terms of the four dimensional modes. Here, J in dis indexes the Kaluza Klein modes. And if you ask for the number of states that are effectively light at momentum p, you get an additional factor of pr to the n, where r is the radius of compactification of the extra dimensions. So in this way, you see that the reason that you're getting this power law running from a four-dimensional perspective is that you have a huge number of kaluza klein modes um, if your parameter r is big. So... Let's now consider what happens if you have a warp metric that addresses the hierarchy. 
Remember, in this case, we have Planck energies here. And in some sense, the maximal energy on the, this brain would be TeV um, due to this warp factor. So the first difference that I want to point out is that this is not a very large extra dimension. The whole point is that because there's this, log, this exponential factor, this exponential warp factor, you don't need a large extra dimension to generate a, higher, a large hierarchy. In fact, you only need the logarithm of a large number, which is some modest number. And with a number like that, it's reasonable to consider putting gauge bosons into the bulk. So the first difference is that the bulk is not big. The next difference, which um, is really quite intriguing, is the fact that it's not true that TV is the fundamental scale. It depends where you are, uh, what you'd see as the highest energy scale. And this is a point we're going to come back to several times. So if you were here, you'd say that the Planck scale was the highest scale. Um, if we do indeed live here, we'd say that the TV was the maximal scale. But at different points in the bulk, you see that you, would probe different, and you can probe different energy scales. So bulk physics accesses high energies. Um, and in fact, when we first developed the um, solution to the hierarchy, it's, it seemed that we should be able to incorporate unification for just this reason. Um, the problem seems to be, seemed to be that from the point of view of us sitting on the TV brain, we see the theory getting strongly coupled at about the TV scale. So how do we get up to the extra dimensions? And that's the point I'll return to. But the important point here is that if we do put in bulk gauge bosons, they do, in fact, probe high energy. And the final difference is that when we do the calculation in the extra dimensional space, and that's how we're going to address this problem of strong coupling, we're actually going to go to the five dimensional theory rather than try to do it from a four dimensional perspective. But the final difference is that when you do this calculation, you find logarithmic and not power law running of the coupling. And the reason for that is actually fairly simple to understand according to the logic we just went through. If you actually just looked at what the spectrum of Kaluza Klein modes is in this case, you of course have a zero mode gauge boson. And then you'd have Kaluza Klein modes of the gauge boson separated roughly by a TV scale. Depends on the precise parameters of the theory. But the point is that not very far above that scale, you're presumably going to hit um, strong coupling effects, quantum gravity effects. So you're not going to have a spectrum that continues all the way up to high energy. Um, at a scale maybe 4 or 5 TV, 10 TV, you're going to run into strong coupling. So you will only have a few Kaluza Klein modes that you can treat perturbatively. So because there's only about lambda over K modes, I should mention K was the parameter appearing in that exponential. It's related to the ADS curvature scale. And lambda is the cutoff, which I'm imposing in the theory because I'm not doing an exact quantum gravity theory. The number of modes would be lambda over K, approximately. So if I were to do the same argument and just add it up all the contribution from all the Kaluza Klein modes to the running of the coupling, I'd find that it went like a, a beta function with a logarithm, and maybe there's some multiplicity factor of, of order lambda over k. Just to avoid confusion later, I just want to point out that um, how the couplings, there's going to be two different things you might consider how an individual coupling runs and how quickly you approach unification. Um, that's going to depend on whether or not you actually have a unified group in the theory, as we'll see later. So if you have a unified group, the running of the coupling won't have this extra lambda over k effect, because that would be SU5 symmetric. So you would just get the standard scale for unification. If it's not true that you have the full unified group, then the scale for unification might also be lowered. Okay. Now, I think it, at, at this point, we can look back and say it's pretty obvious that we should get logarithmic running of the coupling. After all, we know there's a four-dimensional dual theory. And so it should have four-dimensional behavior. However, I think it's very nice to actually do the calculation of the five-dimensional theory and see what's going on in the five-dimensional theory to make it behave like a four-dimensional theory. And furthermore, the four-dimensional theory does have strong coupling. So it wasn't clear that we could do a reliable calculation. So the question is how to evaluate this running. And like I said, I mean, the obvious thing seemed to, that the way we did lots of calculations is in a four-dimensional effective theory. But if you do a four-dimensional effective theory and you're sitting on the TV brain, you see the theory getting strongly coupled at a TV. So that didn't seem very reliable. I should mention that um, Pomerol actually did look at unification of couplings, but he had the whole theory sitting on the Planck brain. So it was obvious that you could go to high energies. However, in that case, you don't address the hierarchy. We just made the obvious. Um, observation that the coupling of the zero mode is the same whether you're on the Planck brain or the TV brain. 
So you shouldn't find a significant difference um, in the behavior of the couplings. So if they unified when you sit on the plank brain, they should more or less unify when you sit on the TV brain. And I'll see, we'll see what more or less means at the end of the talk. Um, so one might want, so we decided we would do the full five-dimensional calculation to see more precisely what's happening. Um, you might um, try to use the gauge invariant like Pauli Villar's regulator, and some people have done that in the literature. We were a little worried about that because it's not a standard Pauli Villar's calculation in the sense that you cannot take the Pauli Villar's mass to infinity. If you take the Pauli Villar's mass to infinity, you lose the fact that there's this relatively low cutoff um, sitting somewhere near your local uh, curvature scale. So if you take the Pauli Villar mass to infinity, it would just look like flat space, which is just not true. Um, so, and, and in particular, because you're leaving the Pauli Villar mass low, which is to say your cutoff is low, um, you would have like ghosts in the theory, which basically appear at the cutoff of your theory. Um, it probably is okay to do this calculation, but we didn't entirely trust it. So we chose instead to do sort of a brute force approach and just incorporate manifestly the physics of the fact that we have the spatially varying cutoff because of the warp factor. So that's the calculation we did. And so in particular, at a position z, this is now the conformal coordinate, um, you would have a, have a cutoff not lambda, but lambda over z which is required by general covariance. So we just decided to just go ahead and do the full five-dimensional calculation. Um, I should mention that when we do this five-dimensional calculation, we do a mixed um, momentum position space um, calculation, position space for the fifth dimension, which has the brains as boundaries, and standard momentum space for the four-dimensional theory. And this is just to say that we have the five-dimensional Lagrangian and we do the standard type of calculation, putting in appropriate gauge fixing. Um, so what we needed to find was the propagator in five dimensions. And it's actually quite edifying to find the propagator, um, it, and as we'll see in a moment. So we wanted to find this propagator, which involved um, solving the screen function equation. We solved this similar to the way one might solve for the propagator for the graviton. Um, you can solve it incorporating independently in the two regions, incorporating the Planck brain incorporating the TV brain and matching across the delta function. And that gave you the Green's function in terms of Bessel functions. Um, that probably doesn't say very much to you at this point. Let me just look at a couple of limits just because it's quite interesting. If you look at low momentum of this Green's function, you find exactly the behavior you expect, 1 over Q squared, which is the behavior of a zero mode. So this is to say at momentum much less than TV. I should say T is indexing the TV brain. If you look at light momenta compared to TV, you'd find that it looked like there was just a zero mode. However, if you look at momenta um, above a TV, less than M Planck, you find that it scales like 1 over Q squared log Q, which is what you knew the behavior should be in this ADS space. Um, it's also behavior that you can see from the conformal field theory side. Um, however, if you look at, at momenta that are beyond where you really think you should be studying this theory, for example, if you're sitting on the TV brain and you go to momenta high compared to TV, you find that the propagator goes like 1 over Q which is to say it looks like five-dimensional flat space. And you can understand that as a large number of calusa klein modes, or you can just understand that as when you get beyond the scale k, you begin to probe the genuine flat space region in your theory when you're less than a curvature scale. And this is just to say the obvious thing, that in order for this to be true, you need the uh, fifth coordinate to be very, uh, very close to see this five-dimensional behavior. So we did the calculation. Um, cal found the vertices, calculated the function, the running. But I think the, the important point here was the regularization scheme, how we did that, and that gives us some insight into the physics. As I said, general covariance required that for a cutoff lambda um, at a position z, the cutoff would look like lambda over z, not just lambda. Um, it's interesting just to rephrase this. This is kind of obvious, but this is the same as saying qz is less than lambda over k. In other words, Having a, a cutoff on energy implies a cutoff on position. So given the fact that we say that the cutoff should be somewhere around lambda, that there's some quantum gravity scale of order lambda, that means that if we are um, looking at some fixed momentum Q, we'd only see that momentum up to some position in the space. And that's, in fact, true. We know that the cutoff is dropping here. So for example, if you had a 10 to the 10th TeV mode, you wouldn't be able to see it on the TeV brain. So it looks like there's some spatial cutoff, which is a result of an energy cutoff, which is in some sense a UVIR connection. Um, there's actually a subtlety with this, um, 
which is that if you actually have, if you actually do just impose a position cutoff for fixed momentum, you're not going to get the right answer. The reason you're not going to get the right answer, um, this is just a simple example to illustrate why you won't get the right answer. For example, if you were to look at the contribution of the zero mode, the zero mode really extends across the entire space. If you were to arbitrarily say there's a spatial cutoff in your theory, you clearly wouldn't get the right answer because you wouldn't get the contribution from all of space. Um, there, so what we interpreted this to mean is that when, when you take a spatial cutoff, you also have to change the boundary conditions. In other words, if I'm up at momentum Q, I don't even know about the existence of this TV brain. So it doesn't make sense to be imposing an infrared cutoff at the TV scale. In, in fact, we impose an infrared cutoff where the, the position is that we've determined by the cutoff of the theory for a given momentum. So, in other words, there are two steps to the regularization procedure that we use. One is to just say that this condition has to be satisfied, and the other is that we actually keep reapplying the boundary conditions. So, in other words, at a given momentum, it's as if you only have a smaller part of the space, this part of the space that allows that momentum. And once you do that, it's straightforward to do the calculation. You do that, and you find that the answer is quite compelling. In fact, what you find is the, con the contribution, and here we're just using the contribution from the gauge bosons to the running. The contribution is very similar to what you would get just in four dimensions. Um, the difference being that you can have this additional lambda over k behavior, which is in some sense can be thought of as a contribution from clues to climb modes. Because we've changed the boundary each place, we find that it's different Kaluza Klein modes that would contribute at different momentous scale. But, in, but when you add them all up, you're getting a, a logarithmic running of the coupling. Um, if you did the integration in another order, there's a more obvious uh, way to see this lambda over k dependence. And that's just the fact that in this region, once you get beyond this, lo this k, e to the minus, this k over z region, you know that you're actually in flat space. The propagator is 1 over q there, not 1 over q squared. So here you have a much more divergent calculation. And you can see that you, by doing the, just the obvious integral with over u minus v, that it turns into 1 over q cubed. So in other words, you do have this parallel behavior in this small region that looks like flat space. And that's where that lambda over k effect is coming from. So it's as if there's a residue of parallel behavior. So the upshot, I do want to make one comment about the power law behavior, which is that I think it's very interesting if one could actually understand this calculation, the entire calculation, from the dual side. Because if you could do that from the dual side, we know this is piece of the calculation that is coming from the flat space regime. Now, that, that piece of the calculation is, of course, very cutoff dependent. It goes like lambda. But if you actually had a real implementation of this theory based on string theory, for example, you should, in principle, be able to probe the flat space regime um, in this duality. So the upshot is that the couplings more or less run as in the standard model. Not necessarily as in the supersymmetric standard model, um, but as in the standard model. So you get rough unification. You obviously can go to high scale. You obviously can get logarithmic running of the couplings. Then the question of whether you actually precisely unify becomes much more model dependent and also would require a more accurate calculation uh, than the one we did. I'll just make a few comments about this calculation. Of course, there are many. This is not an exact calculation, which is one reason I'm not very bothered that the couplings don't precisely unify. But I do find it very compelling that the couplings can approximately unify because it's clear that unification is possible in the context of this scenario and it would depend on the model. Um, the reason I don't entirely trust the calculation is this is, of course, just a leading order calculation. We haven't put in the cut, extra cutoff dependence. There's also a fair bit of model dependence. Um, for example, one obvious model dependence that's easy to account for is the fact that we need to know whether or not we actually had a true unified group. Even if we have a heavy X and Y gauge bosons, the kaluza klein mode still would contribute in the running. The kaluza klein modes are still light. So if you had X and Y gauge bosons, you know this lambda over K effect would be entirely SU5 symmetric, and there would be none, and it would look just like standard model. Um, of course, the one thing that it doesn't have, uh, which is why the couplings aren't precisely unifying, is the Higgs. 
it does, also doesn't have all the supersymmetric partners, but it doesn't have the Higgs. And that's an interesting question of how the Higgs would contribute. Now, for this scenario to address the hierarchy, the Higgs has to be on the TV brain. That's a given. It won't address the hierarchy otherwise. Now, of course, if it's sitting on the TV brain, it's not actually contributing directly to running above the TV scale because it's not even there. However, to get a Higgs on the TV brain, generally you would need something carrying um, weak char electroweak charge that sits in the bulk. This is especially clear if you were to look at the conformal field theory side where the Higgs would be a bound state of some charged objects. So it's clear there's some unknown model dependence, and without a detailed model, it's, it's unclear exactly what the couplings do. This is just a comment that you do actually get the same answer if you use poly -Bilars. and um, And I do think that um, it's quite important that high-scale unification is easily achievable in this model. Um, and it would presumably be true for other curved spaces as well. The important point is that if you have this highly curved space, you're not getting this large kaluza klein contribution that makes the couplings blow up right away. You're, you're able to run up to high, much higher scales. Um, the other point that I want to spend the remaining time uh, focusing on is that I'm, I'm using this very loosely. I should really put it in quotes, but it's an explicit realization of a sort of UVIR correspondence in the sense that we're imposing an energy cutoff on the theory, and that's implying a position cutoff when we do our calculation. And I think it was quite notable that the bulk calculation that we did gave four-dimensional behavior. In other words, a logarithmic running of a coupling is not indicative of a five-dimensional theory, but indicative of a four-dimensional theory. So, so, so this regularization procedure embodies the fact that we know that the, in this highly curved space, it should act four-dimensionally. So even if I didn't know there was an ADS-CFT correspondence, I would still, just from doing the five-dimensional calculation, conclude that it's behaving like a four-dimensional theory. So presumably, somehow, this should give some insight into the counting of states um, in curved spaces. It's not going, of course, it's not going to tell us everything, but in a space that's already curved, it's interesting to look at how, how you would count states and see um, whether or not it agrees with the expectation that it would look like the boundary theory counting of states. So um, I'm going to just very briefly tell you what we did. Um, suppose you have a metric of this form where V of R is determined by which particular space you're looking at. Uh, this covers some interesting examples, namely global ADS, de Sitter, black holes. And you were asked to count states. So if you were asked to count states in a curved space, um, I should say we're counting states as a function of energy. It's very easy to convert this into a thermodynamic calculation where you're calculating the free energy as a function of temperature or the entropy as a function of temperature. Um, it basically has the same dependence. But if we were just counting the number of states appropriate to a given energy, um, of course, your naivest thing is in end dimensions would be e to the n minus 1, r to the n minus 2, dr. However, because we're in a curved space, the metric is non-trivial, you would, of course, put in the fact that you want the local energy and the proper volume. So you would put in appropriate factors of the metric. So if you were to do that, you would still get e to the n minus 1, but you would get um, not an integral of just r to the n minus 2, but it's r to the n minus 2 over v of r to the n over 2. Now, of course, this is the behavior you would expect in an n-dimensional theory that, that didn't have holographic behavior, that is to say that behave, had volume behavior. For example, if E became the cutoff, you would say lambda to the n minus 1. But we know that in certain curved spaces, we expect fewer states. So where is that com coming from? Well, that's coming from precisely the fact that we're imposing this infrared cutoff. In other words, this cutoff R sub E. So R sub E is, in fact, a function of E. The boundary of this integral is a function of E. We don't integrate over the whole space. It depends on energy. And it's imp implemented, what R E is found by imposing E is less than the square root of V R E times the cutoff, analogously to what we had done in the ADS space. So we're extrapolating what seemed to work in the ADS space to see whether we can use that to count states more generally. So... An extremely trivial example is um, global ADS space, which I just roughly sketched here. Um, again, this is five dimensions, so you have R cubed over V of R to the five halves. You naively would get E to the fourth, but if you actually do the integral, you have dr over R squared, which gives you one over R. R has, is E over K lambda. So this additional dependence, lambda over E, converts you from having five dimensional behavior to having four dimensional behavior. So you see that in the curved space, you have many fewer states. Um, you can apply this to other, state, other cases. So another interesting example was to look at the static patch of de Sitter space. 
And again, remember, we're just saying for a given energy, you can only probe so far. So in this case, you can only get, have a high energy state as defined at infinity or where the metric is just trivial, um, is flat, by saying that this energy can, state can only get so close to the horizon. So in effect, it's regulating the theory. So this regularization is in some way similar to what a Chuff test had did when he considered a field outside a black hole, for example. He had a brick wall. We're saying instead of having a brick wall, um, there's a real spatial cutoff that's actually imposed by requiring that energy should be less than the local cutoff, the local en energy cutoff. So if you were to do that in this case, you, f you find that you get E cubed R to the fourth. Um, you put in the appropriate V of R for the static patch of de Sitter space. And you find that, indeed, you get an additional energy dependence, for, again, from this R sub E. It's interesting, though. It's not lambda over E, which would just reduce it automatically by one dimension. It's lambda squared over E squared. So the answer that you get this way, um, which is the same answer that you get with a Tiff's brick wall calculation or Myers data polyvalar's calculation in the case of black holes, is E lambda squared R cubed. So the lambda squared is the right dependence for an area law, but we have E R cubed. So it's only when you take the energy to be of order the temperature, which is of order 1 over R, that you would actually get the expected lambda squared R squared behavior. And of course, the interpretation of this is that this is a surprisingly large number of states at this low temperature, T of order 1 of R. That is to say, you get this number of states you expect, E cubed R cubed, times this enhancement factor, lambda squared over E squared. Now, one can ask, why is this happening? Didn't I say that this whole procedure was to have the reduced number of states that you get in curved space? But of course, it's because if you require that you're at this temperature or at this energy, this low energy, you're not probing in most of the space all of the states up to high energy. So you're basically only counting the states appropriate to this low energy uh, de Sitter space. So in principle, there should be much more energetic states sitting elsewhere. It's just that those aren't generally being probed. So I'm just going to make a few comments, and then I'll conclude. So this worked for basically all the curved spaces that manifestly have holographic behavior. And it's clear why it works. It's this additional energy dependence imposed by the spatial, um, by the spatial cutoff. I, I think it's interesting to approach it this way because it's actually, we're not saying that there's a boundary theory. We're saying that there's a bulk theory. The bulk theory just is automatically giving you the behavior as if it were a boundary theory. So in the case of global ADS or ADS, it's giving you the boundary that has the highest cutoff. In the case of the black hole or a de Sitter, it's giving you where the cutoff, where the um, GETT is the smallest. The reason it's doing that is because then locally, you can go up, all the way up to the cutoff. So on the horizon, you actually see more states than you expect. And that's why it looks like a boundary theory, because that's where the states begin to pile up. They don't exact precisely live there. It's a function of energy. But that's where you find the most states. Um, I mean, what is this good for? Well, perhaps um, one can address questions like, what is the meaning of the cutoff? It, 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 the cutoff dependence should certainly be absorbed by whatever the quantum gravity theory is. So maybe it's telling you something about how the string behavior sh should act with, um, to compensate for this cutoff dependence that we find. Um, that's what this point is. Um, I think it's also interesting because, in some sense, it suggests that the counting when we count these entropies, it's not counting the number of states that one can in principle excite. It's counting the number of states that are excited, for example, at a given temperature. And there really are many sort of stored states that might also be excited. Um, of course, I haven't addressed the fact that I used a coordinate dependent um, calculation in the sense that I, I used to, this only works for time independent metrics because we're counting something specific. We're counting energy eigenstates. So I'm just going to conclude. Um, with respect to the first part of the talk, I do actually think it, it is quite important that unification is possible. For me, at least, it does make this idea of the warped hierarchy solution more compelling. Um, I think it might actually be true, and it probably... I, I also like the idea that a TV is a local property. It's not necessarily the fundamental scale of the theory, but where we are, according to the metric, we see the TV. And um, I also think it's interesting to study these theories as concrete examples with which to study gravity. Like I said, in this case, without invoking the conformal field theory in ADS space, we saw four-dimensional behavior. And that might give us some additional insight into this space or other curved spaces. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Uh,
So the idea of getting uh, unification of couplings out of these scenarios is very attractive, but I think the uh, preceding talk had a very important uh, lesson. And if I'm not mistaken, what you're doing is for a given virtual energy, you're throwing out, or, or sorry, you're only keeping, uh, say, gauge boson states above a certain